I'm not afraid of failing. I'm afraid that my potential might set the world on fire. Hello, lovely listener. I'm your host, Lindsay, and you're listening to Two Cents Podcast, your audible anthology. The piece I've just recited is one from Homebody by acclaimed poet Rupi Kaur. It is her third book and bestseller, garnering 4.8 stars out of 5 on Amazon and 4.1 out of 5 on Goodreads. Quite commendable. Kaur is seen as the pioneer of the fairly new subgenre of Instagram poetry. And while Insta poetry isn't as aged as other subgenres, it has amassed a dedicated following. And in the same breath, there is some notable criticism directed at it. Aside from the one liners begging for depth or the unproductive use of indentations, the greater question lingers Is this type of work considered poetry? Let's get into that. Cue the intro. Rupi Kaur is an Indian-born Canadian poet, illustrator, author and photographer. She gained popularity through her short poems that featured illustrations. The main themes of her work include feminism, her experiences as an immigrant and relationships. Her debut book, Milk and Honey, performed phenomenally, selling 3 million copies worldwide. I remember seeing her work all over social media. There was something about the brevity of expression accompanied with an abstract illustration that seemed so deep at the time. Miss Kaur is a leader in the world of Insta poetry. And since Milk and Honey, she has been on a roll, publishing a second and third book. She was part of BBC's 100 Women in 2017, and in 2019, she was dubbed, titled, or crowned the Writer of the Decade by the New Republic, a progressive magazine. Before we get into her latest release, I'd like to touch on a few pieces from her previous books. I must say that Milk and Honey is pretty dear to me. I didn't really like the style, but because I saw it everywhere, it grew on me. In its own way, the poetry was rebellious. I know using lowercase letters and free verse isn't anything new, but the lack of formality and pressing subject matter that would occasionally occur really had an appealing edge. In paying tribute to my frenemy, Milk and Honey, here's a poem. You tell me to quiet down, because my opinions make me less beautiful. But I was not made with a fire in my belly, so I could be put out. I was not made with a lightness in my tongue, so I could be easy to swallow. I was made heavy, half blade and half silk, difficult to forget, but not easy for the mind to follow. Here we've got lines of affirmations. They're mostly motivational. I think this poem wants to confront the silencing of women by emphasizing the strength of the female voice with comparisons as seen in the lines, quote, But I was not made with a fire in my belly so I could be put out. I was not made with a lightness in my tongue so I could be easy to swallow. I was made heavy. End quote. However, I don't understand the concluding lines, half blade and half silk, difficult to forget, but not easy for the mind to follow. Next, we have a piece from The Sun and Her Flowers, her second book. Most of her poems don't have titles, so I'll just get into it. This is the recipe of life said my mother, as she held me in her arms as I wept. Think of those flowers you plant in the garden each year. They will teach you that people too must wilt, fall, root, rise in order to bloom. Well put. I actually really like the indentations in this one, especially in the lines must wilt, 
fall, root, rise in order to bloom. I've noticed that Insta poets exploit their enter keys, which ruins the fluency, but this was done fairly well. So that is a taste of her work so far. From what I've gathered, the themes of expatriation, relationships, love, heartbreak, and the female experiences are present in all three books. With that being said, I'm quoting a rating from a Goodreads user who said, She, who is Rupi, didn't write three books. She wrote the same book three times. I found this to be hilarious when I first read it, and I agree. We'll explore more ratings later. For now, let's get into Homebody. When I reviewed Dandelion by Gabby Hanna in episode two, I split my reactions into categories. And I've done the same thing here. So we have five categories for this book. Fairly good. Potential. Bland. Self-help. And social justice rhetoric. I tallied each category out of the 189 poems and the percentages are as follows. Fairly good. Poetry accounts for 10% of the book. Potential constitutes 14% of the book. Bland makes up 34%, self-help accounts for 9.5%, and social justice rhetoric makes up 6% of the book. The book has four chapters, mind, heart, rest, and awake. I want to be very honest with you. Analyzing or or critiquing Insta poetry is a bit challenging. On one hand, I could read the poem and just say, well, it's self-explanatory. Or I'd be recycling the same comments, like, it's too short, or there's no depth. For that reason, I will briefly go over the poems in their categories so that we can have the larger discussion around Insta poetry as a whole. Again, most poems didn't have titles, so I've titled them just so there's a flow between reciting the poems and discussing them. Starting off in the fairly good section, in the fourth chapter, Awake, we have Stage, and it reads... Can you hear the women who came before me? 500,000 voices ringing through my neck, as if this were all a stage built for them. I can't tell which parts of me are me and which parts are them. Can you see them taking over my spirit, shaking out of my limbs to do everything they couldn't do when they were alive? I absolutely love the illustration in this poem. She's engaging some senses. Can you hear, can you see these hundreds of thousands of women who are long gone and their voices that project themselves through her? She is their legacy. She has the freedom to do what they couldn't and she's now commemorating them in her freedom. On to the poems with potential. The case for most of these is that they just need more depth. We have love and violence. I have difficulty separating abusive relationships from healthy ones. I can't tell the difference between love and violence. It all looks the same. And to that, I'd ask, how so? This poem, air quotes poem, is very prosaic. It's just masquerading as one because of the indentations. There is no point to think over nor does she expand on the difficulty of separating abusive relationships from healthy ones. What causes this lack of discretion? And why do they look the same? To be honest, this mound of questions is what I have with a lot of Insta poetry that I come across. The why and how. And it's interesting because an article that we'll explore in a bit talks about how the fundament of poetry is to make you think. And I would suggest less than to feel. Words have the power to conjure up feelings. There's no doubt about that. But I'd argue that the power of poetry comes from its technicality. The way that poetic devices are used to illustrate, compare and give perspective gives us the chance to really mull over what we've just read. And I get that I'm saying, and I get that what I'm saying might imply that such poems need to be long and grandiose, but length and diction are merely characteristics. It should be about skill, taking a technique and using it well. Next we have from the chapter Awake, and this poem is titled Birth. I fell 
from the mouth of my mother's legs into the palms of this world with God herself raging in me. So we might disagree on the sufficiency of this poem, but to start, I do commend the illustrations. This piece reminded me of William Blake's Infant Sorrow, which reads, My mother groaned, my father wept, into the dangerous world I leapt. Helpless, naked, piping loud, like a fiend, hid in a cloud, struggling in my father's hands, striving against my swaddling bands, bound and weary, I thought best to sulk upon my mother's breast. The two poems are very illustrative and have some degree of symbolism. In the first line of Ruby's poem, that reads, I fell from the mouth of my mother's legs. The words I fell connote negativity. Falling is generally a negative thing. For example, we've heard the idea of a fallen angel or a fallen empire. This line is describing the struggle of birth into this world, and I'd harmonize it with the lines in Blake's poem. Quote, my mother groaned, my father wept. Into the dangerous world, I leapt. Rupi's poem doesn't give me enough to know if she sees the world in a negative or positive light, but she does go on to say that she fell into the world with God herself raging in her. You see that reflexive pronoun for emphasis in God herself? This is implying that though she has fallen into the world, she encases a divine power, but it ends there. By and large, this poem can speak to one's self-image, which I think is another characteristic of Insta poetry. The reason why it is under the potential category is the fact that it reads like a nice idea that could be expanded on. Imagine if Blake's poem just read, My mother groaned, my father wept, into the dangerous world, I leapt. It's not bad, but he goes on and expounds on his idea of panic and struggle and ends in a place of indifference. So, more. It would be nice if she gave us more. Now on to the bland or unimpressionable poetry. From the chapter Mind, we have the poem Quietly Loud, and it reads, I have never known anything more quietly loud than anxiety. Well, first of all, it's, this is a plain statement. My main concern is the oxymoron quietly loud and how it's been used here. The poem doesn't read fluently because of it, because this oxymoron feels so forced. I have never known anything more quietly loud than anxiety. It just feels like it's been put there to qualify for some sort of use of technique, quietly loud. However, it, like I said, it just doesn't read fluently. Next, we have from the chapter Awake, the poem, You Go Nowhere Alone. It reads, you are one person, but when you move, an entire community walks through you. When I first read this, looking back at her other work, I realized that she has this technique called simple dramatics. She makes dramatic comparisons, but with simple expressions. You are one person, but when you move, an entire community walks through you. I guess maybe to imply the impact that person has. They have the power of a whole community whenever they move. This simple dramatic can, can be good because simplicity can be enjoyable, but it's negative is the fact that it becomes, it gets really boring and repetitive because I've noticed this trend from her other books. So I decided to take some of these poems and showcase their profundity with a little edit. So here they are. Your voice, your voice is, your is your sovereignty. If you're waiting for them to make you feel like you're enough, you'll be waiting a long time. My body renews itself in waves of ocean, of ocean and, and, blood. Blood. and blood. I don't care about perfection. I'd rather the world... 
I don't care about perfection. I'd rather roll deep in the messiness of life. Why do I hurt the ones who want to lift me up and worship the ones who crush me? What made me like this? All right, on to the self-help poetry. In the chapter Mind, Rupi generously gave a list of things to heal your mood. And then we have the poem, Love Yourself. And it reads, You lose everything when you don't love yourself and gain everything when you do. This plainly has the rhetoric of, se- of the self-help industry. Throw in some taps of the enter key and we have what looks to be a poem. Then from the chapter Awake, we have the poem Becoming, Unbecoming and Becoming. It reads, We think we are lost while our fuller, found and complete selves are somewhere in the future. We get on our hands and knees thinking self-improvement will help us reach them. But this Finding ourselves drivel is never going to end. I'm tired of putting off living until I have more information on who I am. I am a new person every month, always becoming and unbecoming, only to become again. Our fuller selves are not off in the future. They're right here, in the only moment that exists. I don't need fixing. I will be searching for answers my whole life. Not because I'm a half-formed thing, but because I'm brilliant enough to keep growing. Everything necessary to live a vivid life already exists in me. I am complete simply because I am imperfect. I really had to think on this one. And I mean, it's great that I'm thinking, referring to what I said about the fundament of poetry being to make us think. But I also want to pose this to you. How important is it for a poem to be coherent? I noticed this poem had inconsistencies, and I wouldn't want to sit here and nitpick, but an example I'd give is a speaker saying that their fullest self is not in the future, but in the present moment. Yet they'll be searching for answers their whole life. Doesn't that imply that they weren't full? In the first place, you say you are a full person now, but you will be searching for answers for the rest of your life. I don't know if you could tell, but the poem is very compelling. I mean, there's no punctuation, but it just goes on and on like an impassioned ramble. But when you try and dissect it, you realize what's not connecting. Back to the importance of poetry being coherent. I'm sure there'll be two leanings. Either, yes, a poem should be coherent and make sense, and no, it isn't that important. And while you form your opinion, hear me out on this. It's not easier to get away with a poem that doesn't make sense because poems are relatively shorter than, say, a book, so it's not pages long of things that don't add up. In that case, if it's easier to get away with, is coherence important? To add to that, a common caricature of poetry is that it can be elusive and sometimes And it's sometimes prized because it's hard to understand or it can be hard to understand. So you can let me know how important coherence is. Email me or DM me on Instagram at 2 pnf. To close up this category of self-help poetry, I'll refer to the title of this episode. Homebody is a self-help book at best. And I stand by these words. The pieces I've read are some of many that reiterate a high self-esteem, self-love, and self-care. Even though these poems are under a specific poetry, I'd argue that 95 of her poems are laced with self-help. Moving on, we have social justice rhetoric. Now, we can agree on this, but I'm convinced that the arena of social justice has its collection of phrases that flow from its worldview. There wouldn't be social justice if there weren't any perceived injustices 
And so there's a way these injustices are presented that makes this rhetoric so identifiable. What I'm trying to say is, there is talk about social justice, and then there's social justice rhetoric. One can be congenial, while the other can be a bit too zealous. I'm just going to keep it vague. From social justice rhetoric, we have the poem Never Be Quiet from the chapter Awake. It reads, He says you're opinionated, as if it's an insult to have ideas so big he chokes on the size of them. Never be quiet. Then we have the next poem, The Earth Can't Breathe. It reads, We've ruined our only home for convenience and profit, neither of which will be useful once the earth can't breathe. And now, for the moment you've subconsciously been waiting for, the reviews. The reason why I'm not going to get into these poems is because I think these reviews speak for me, to a certain extent, and I'm emphasizing to a certain extent. So, one review read, and this is from Amazon, read her other books instead. I loved her other books and have read them many times, so I bought this novel excited for another deep dive into her poetry. This book did not give me any of the feelings I felt reading the other books. There were a few good poems, but most of the poetry was preachy and unrelatable. Some poetry was a single sentence on her political beliefs. Waste of paper for one sentence. The book talks about saving the planet while it is ironically a waste itself. Oh yes, the iconic nearly blank pages that define Insta poetry. Aside from pointing that out, I completely agree. Insta poets <laughs> waste a lot of paper. And while I understand it's a style, I don't think it's a productive style. A second review reads, Rupi has gone from writing heartfelt poetry in milk and honey to this self-righteous book of endless complaining. This entire book is a cross between three liners you'd expect on inspirational posters to finger pointing to every man and white person in the world. She informs men they know nothing of women while offering her so-called expertise on men on every other page. This was not written to sell books as much as as much as it was to lay the groundwork for her inevitable man-hating, white-hating, capitalism-hating speaking engagements. And why not? They're more profitable to both her bank account and her ever-expanding ego. I normally read her books and pass them on. I threw this rubbish in the lake behind my house. Oh, that, that was quite a fervent review. Now for a third review. It was quite long, but I'll leave a link if you'd like to go and read it. This one is from Goodreads. There is a quote that led the feminist movement in 1969 that reads, The personal is political. I believe Ruby Kaur and many other trendy political pseudo-intellectual group of people on the internet have this mixed up. They make it political is personal. They take everything to heart, which is understandable, but there's something genuine lacking when that is the case. There's a political cry in something personal. People on the internet need to stop pandering this progressive woke stance to garner attention. I believe honesty and vulnerability is more important, which I know many reviewers believe that Ru that is Rupi Kaur's intentions, which I have nothing to say about that. But sadly, it falls short. Everything she wrote is way too general. There is more to dive into. There has to be. Instead of her writing about how she wants to be in the present over and over, how about describing the present around her? How does she wake up? What surrounds her home? What's inside her home? What does she do to relax or when she's alone? I think people need to stop describing themselves like warriors and survivors and definitely stop making themselves victims and instead open up. Tell me who you are. All I know about Rupi is that she is a woman of color, but you can just Google search her for that. Everything is so vague. There's nothing deep here. I wanted to think that as a poet, she will develop and become a better writer. Unfortunately, I think she is regressing because this is the same stuff 
she has been selling. But hey, if it's not broken, don't fix it, right? Oh wait, doesn't she hate capitalism? The hypocrisy. If she truly, truly hates the system, hates capitalism, she would have gone way deep into this. She would have broke all boundaries, took a chance on a new writing style. You can't stay stagnant as an artist. Yes, you can have a style, but it's fun evolving. And she claims she changes every month. Well, it's not being shown through her writing. Share a moment with your readers. Don't lecture them. Don't tell them things they already know. Yes, the the earth is heating up. Yes, there is racism. Yes, the world is chaotic and no one will live forever. Not you, not me, not your mother or your father. We all experience pain. No one is special. Depression and anxiety are everyday occurrences. We are all part of this experience. But who are you? That's what matters. Who are your loved ones? What are some of your bad habits? What are you interested in? Stop wasting paper, Rupee. You literally wrote a vague poem on climate change that could be ripped off of anyone's Twitter account. The lack of originality and uniqueness deems this book detrimental to Earth's ecosystem. So this review is excellent for two reasons. First of all, this wasn't an anti-Insta poetry ramble. This reader talked about all the themes Rupi writes about. They even incorporated pieces in the book into their arguments, like when they mentioned that Rupi says that she changes every month. That's actually a poem in the book. That kind of detail and thoughtfulness makes the criticism so authentic. Secondly, the way they try to reason with her. The review has the same questions I had when I reviewed and read the poem, the poetry. Why? How? Tell us more. Honestly, this review expressed my thoughts exactly. The reader meant well, and there's proof for what, I'm, for what they're saying. I find it interesting that Homebody seems to be the letdown of all three books. Hopefully, Rupi comes across a review like this one. Okay, so we've read some critical reviews. Let's hear some good reviews. This one says, Embody your woman glory. Rupi Kaur's third collection of poetry, Homebody, perfectly titled, is an exploration of self-love, a struggle with mental illness, and a renewal of a woman's spirit bruised by abuse. This collection is an intimate conversation with Kaur and herself that we were privileged enough to be invited to observe. I especially enjoyed this collection because we see the process in Kaur's evolution maturity and growth as we fly through the pages. She is in a depressed state, in a happy place, basking in her own beautiful individuality. The most important part of growth is the sticky middle, the seesaw between sadness and the desire to feel better. Core explores this in the middle of this book, where she's struggling to pull herself out and separate herself from pain. In this section, she goes up and down, one poem feeling depressed and empty, and then she empowers yourself on the very next page. Then a second review reads, Honestly, I'll start off by saying I don't understand how any poet can just decide that they, can, that they get to define what real poetry is. That's tired. That aside, I'm about halfway through this book. And like always, it's like I'm living outside myself when I read her work. Her honesty and commitment to writing in the way our minds often float through thought is beautiful. The way she takes us on a journey of healing and is always speaking through her own lens is the type of openness I love to indulge in when consuming poetry. I have moments of being in full tears and feel myself mending with the pages only to unravel again. And that's okay. Her work reminds me that the process of feeling is okay and just right, no matter how it happens. I love this and will probably gift it to a few women in my life. I'm generally happy that some readers have been positively impacted with this book. All the reviews I've read are from those who enjoyed Ruby's work or are fans of hers since Milk and Honey, instead of random comments from people who just dislike Insta poetry as a whole. Now I'd like us to assess the opinions of those for and against Insta poetry. Just to summarize what I think about Homebody, 
I really think that there was a drop in quality in this book. I openly admit that I don't like Insta poetry. However, she's released better work than this. And I also noticed the decline in the illustrations, which really, it really impacted me, not going to lie. I also think this might be due to the fact that her writing, st- her writing style is a bit worn out now. Going back to that comment saying that she wrote the same book three times, not only is she sticking to the same subject matter, which isn't really a problem, but she still presents them in the same format so you can predict how she's going to express herself. My two cents worth of a pointer would be to try something new. As simple as that. And I think it's just also necessary as an artist to be looking for change and to reinvent yourself. All right, so let's get into some articles. All the articles mentioned will be linked in a description box or on the website. This one is from Medium, titled, What is Insta Poetry? It's more complicated than what you might think. This article is in support of Insta Poetry, and we'll be discussing how Insta Poetry has made poetry more accessible and why it's so appealing. Let's start off with this paragraph. Quote, I think that to call a whole subset of poetry worthless totally negates what it does accomplish. You can say you don't get it or it's not for you, but you don't have to degrade it to get your point across. All right, let's pause. I agree that Insta poetry has had its share of harsh commentary, and I'd like to talk about two critics, Lindsay Sayeni and Rebecca Watts. Lindsay Sayeni, what a nice name, is a journalist who seems to be active in the poetry community. Ironically, she wrote an article for Medium titled, Instagram poets are ruining everything. And in the article, she wrote, I cannot sit idly by and watch them, Instagram poets, gain traction, attention, and digital fame while real poets are struggling to make ends meet because this is something they're truly passionate about. End quote. So I think her main concern is the fact that the emergence of Insta poetry is at the expense of poets who put more effort into their work and are more conscious about poetry as a classic art form. I think if Insta poets weren't selling as much as they are, it wouldn't be much of an issue. So I think the main problem is the commercial side of it. Now on to Rebecca Watts, who is a poet and has a master's degree in English literature to her name. I'd like to read you a poem of hers from her website. It is titled, When All This Is Over. I mean to run fast, where the buzz of machines and the humdrum of walls and the flummox of words are behind me, where no one, not even myself, observes me. Oh yes, I intend to run in the dark, where the thud of the feet eclipses the thud of the heart, where a chill night bites me and a slick sweat coats me and street lamps gild me and church bells ring me. What a nice read. I love the alliteration in A Slick Sweat Coats Me and the image of being covered in gold in the line and the streets lamp and the street lamps gild me. It's so beautifully expressed. Hopefully I can review a book a book of hers, but truthfully I am a slow reader. Now she provided notable criticism in a publication she produced in 2018 titled Cult of the Noble Amateur. There is some sort of paywall or membership requirement to read the full thing, but I got this quote from the sample and she says, Why is the poetry world pretending that poetry is not an art form? I refer to the rise of a cohort of young female poets who are currently being lauded by the poetic establishment for their honesty and accessibility. Buzzwords for the open denigration of intellectual engagement and rejection of craft that characterizes their work. 
Watts has a greater concern over poetry as a craft and not so much the commercial side of things. And I expected that because she is one of those poets that Lindsay Sayeni is talking about. The ones who want to uphold the standards of the craft but are eclipsed by the influx of Instapoets. But going back to what the Medium article said, Instapoets can do their thing and criticism shouldn't be done maliciously. I think the criticisms mentioned were agreeable. But it's interesting because the critical articles that were hyperlinked at the Medium article shared the same sentiments as these two critics. Continuing the paragraph from the Medium article, the writer says, I think that Instapoetry is one of the most accessible forms of poetry there is. The lines are typically clear, to the point, and short, emotionally intense and vulnerable, not hidden under layers of pretentious metaphor or overly verbose language. In other words, instantly relatable to just about anyone who reads it. I think it is this reliability that has enabled the movement to become as popular as it's been and inspire record high poetry readership to boot. Now we have quite a bit to discuss there. Let's start off with the first point. Insta poetry is one of the most accessible forms of poetry there is. I think this is true. What would Insta poetry be without social media? I think it's actually a byproduct of social media, not even a product, a byproduct, a consequence, if you will, of social media. This work is usually short and is about things we can relate to. So when we're on a scrolling trip on our feeds, these brief pieces can give us that instant feeling of, wow, I just connected with something. Then we move on. A different article made a comment regarding poetry and social media, saying that the neurological effect of social media activity is integral to building communities online and is a contributing factor in the success of literary influences such as Ruby Core. The neurological effect, meaning the neurotransmitters like dopamine that get released in your brain when you're on social media, etc., etc. So these feel-good hormones also contribute to the appeal of Insta poetry because it's designed to, it's designed or intended to make you feel good, make you feel empowered, and make you feel special. The second point is the lines are typically clear to the point and short emotionally intense and vulnerable, not hidden underneath layers of pretentious metaphor or overly verbose language. I find it so funny that both sides use stereotypes of the other to support their criticisms, but that's normal. Here, the common criticism of pretentious metaphor and overly verbose language wouldn't qualify for Rebecca's, Rebecca Watts' poem that I just read. The language is simple. There is no overarching metaphor to crack. It's quite apparent that she's talking about when this life is over. However, I know that there are some overly ambitious works and writers out there. But I got to understand that what they were saying, the niceness of short and straight to the point poetry that's emotionally intense, because they provided a poem from an assumed instapoet, Tyler Not Gregson, which reads, What should I say? When I want to kiss the side of your neck and leave it at that. When I want to feel the heat of my own breath bounce back. And my warm lips, after I strategically place them on my favorite pieces of your skin. I want to leave goosebumps everywhere I have not yet kissed and spend the night trying to read them. Like Braille. This poem is longer than what you normally get under Insta Poetry. But that is a good read. And while this example makes the infamous characteristics of Insta Poetry more credible, I don't think this is the type of Insta Poetry that's ruffling feathers. It's the inspirational quotes masquerading as poetry that are part of the issue. And that brings us to number three. Insta Poetry is instantly relatable to just about anyone who reads it. Take this anecdote from from a writer at The Spectator UK. They talked about a 
42-year-old woman named Monica, who said that she looked forward to the posts of Instapoet J. Iron Word every day because they express, quote, what we all feel. And she didn't feel so alone having read their work. The article goes on to say that this is key to the appeal. At least half of what passes for Insta poetry is motivational. It's designed to tell readers that they are precious, that the pain will pass, that there is someone out there for everyone. It's designed, in other words, to make you feel better. And there is no inherent problem with that. In the Medium article, the writer mentions that Ruby Kaur herself said that she writes poetry for that brown woman in Brampton who was trying to live, survive, get through her day. Back to the Spectator article. In the beginning, the writer says, Because the truth is, the vast majority of Insta poetry is terrible. Another thing Ibrahimi told me is that you shouldn't really describe writing as bad because that's subjective. You should just say it's not really for you. But I have to say, the more Insta poetry I read, the harder I'm finding it to agree. And I second that. There's no issue over how this poetry impacts others. But critically speaking, it's not that good. How far can poetry and motivation slash self-help overlap until one is compromised? And by one, I mean the former, poetry. Another aspect about this relatability point is it doesn't prompt you to think wider outside what you know. And there's a lot of recycling of phrases that happens when you're trying to be relatable. And I'm bringing up this quote from The Tempest, where the writer says about Insta poetry, quote, The taste of salt, honey, water, and mango have been shoved into my mouth so often that I don't understand what they mean to the specific writer or what they add to the poem. That's a great line, but so true. It is in the name of relatability and motivation that these phrases are used. The writer ended the article partly with this line. Quote, We need to embrace poems that get at the crux of humanity and make your stomach churn. And I totally agree. But Insta poetry, for the most part, is showing us that that's not what most readers want, which takes us to the fourth point from the Medium article. Number four, Insta poetry has inspired record high poetry readership to boot. I wouldn't really describe poetry as being all the rage in the early 2000s, but even stats show that following the emergence of milk and honey and others alike, people have been reading more poetry. A US report stated that 12% of adults, or roughly 20 million, 28 million people, read poetry in the past year, that year being 2018. Quote, These numbers, the highest on record in the survey's 15-year history, might seem meagre in a world where the latest blockbuster is considered a disappointment despite amassing sales topping $100 million in its opening weekend. But in the poetry world, 28 million adult readers represent a significant uptick from the previous survey in 2012, which showed only 7% of the population reading poetry. End quote. Not only that, but 12 of the top 20 best-selling poets in 2018 were popularized by Instagram. The bookseller also notes that poetry sales have increased by 66% in the past five years. So Insta poetry is undoubtedly popular. And you can even say lucrative. I'd like to bring up a quote from Susie Atkins, who is a director of communications and is a faculty advisor to a literary ma magazine. She says, On one level, I think that bottom line, more poetry is a good thing. And yet, I would also want to challenge people to think about what constitutes poetry versus meaningless fluff. Poetry, real poetry, 
depends on elements of form and structure that take a message beyond just an emotional outpouring to something with staying power. It challenges people to engage thoughtfully. And once more, I agree. More poetry is great, more talent to discover, and you have more people poetically articulating our current experience. She said something interesting, thinking about what constitutes poetry. And that took me back to another article that brought up the point, if there are different subsets and and periods of poetry, like performance, slam, etc., can we use the criteria of the past to assess the works we have today? And I think this point is countered with sitting down and trying to discern poetry from the meaningless fluff. I know that I'm just throwing articles everywhere, but a writer at the Daily Illini wrote an, a critical article but ended saying, quote, Even with these Instagram poets, at least there is an audience that wants to read and be involved in literature. Hopefully, their audience is also consuming great literary and poetic works other than just Insta poetry. End quote. And you guessed it. I agree. It's great that there's more poetry out there and that people are reading more poetry or starting with Insta poetry. But Insta poetry shouldn't be their final destination. There are so many talented poets on Instagram who aren't part of the Insta Poetry Brigade, and I'll mention them and their work later on. So we've just discussed some points about and surrounding Insta Poetry. Now let's hear the experience of a fake Insta Poet. This was a four-week experiment conducted by a journalist at Vice, and I was enthralled by the idea of faking being an Insta Poet. This article and experiment was really an eye-opener for me about Insta Poetry. So with that said, let's venture. The journalists created their Instagram poetry account and used the handle at Raven Stairs Poetry. And it's still up with its last post being in October 2019. In the first week regarding writing their poems, the fake Insta Poet remarked that It was liberating to not have any standards. And by the end of the week, they garnered 281 followers. In the second week, they set a challenge for themselves to set the standard as low as they possibly could. But at the end of the week, they had 350 followers with pieces like Love is a drug that you can't prescribe. Love is a rain. That pause inside. In the third week, the fake Insta poet was taken aback by the support he was receiving, describing the heartfelt words as sincere comments to insincere poetry. The fourth week marked the hundredth and final post, and it epically reads Is this a poem? Indentations. And all. To top that, Raven Stairs Poetry also got a compliment from top Insta poet Atticus, who produces work like There is all sorts of magic beaming in your bones. And I thought it was just the calcium. Such work is treasured by his one and a half million followers. At the end of this experiment, the journalist mentioned some agreeable points. For one, it's true that people don't really have that much time, and I'd argue interest, in dissecting the poems of old. And the simplicity of Insta poetry is appealing for that reason. But what I think was most important is the fact that it wasn't hard to fake this talent. However, People genuinely connected with it. I wouldn't be shocked if Raven Stairs released a poetry book and it would be hounded by his supporters because that is how much they felt the words, no matter how they came to be. With that being said, I always 
like to round the discussion back to the main title of the episode. And in the beginning, I raised the question of whether Insta poetry could be considered poetry. That was probably a bit dramatic, but I think it's another, but I genuinely think it's another subset of this wonderful art, and it has come to stay. Having said that, I repeat, let's not limit ourselves to she wasn't doing it for you. She was always a rose, and this time she was blooming for herself. One of R.H. Sin's works, because there is more beyond this. And speaking of more, here are some poets that you should check out. First up, we have at underscore poetic device. I cannot tell you how much I love his work. He's genuinely underrated, so let's show him some appreciation. The first poem that grabbed my attention was Mirage, and it reads, It is when my feet plot through vacant spaces that these vapours of imagination gust towards what could be tween now and then you and I, never and always. And when my hands plough through the desert of doubt, I approach your oasis. But you occur like a flash of summer rain. Such a great piece, and I've read it more than I can count. The one thing that grabs me, oddly enough, is the omission in Tween Now and Then. It gets me all the time, because it's such a classic technique. To treat you, I'll read your second one, titled Blaze. It reads, Such is your nature. To be close is to burn, and distant to freeze. But I kept you ignited as a cool, passing breeze. Go give at Poetic devices some support. His account will be linked in the description box or on the website. Next we have King Sella, who was featured in episode 3. He doesn't post his work on Instagram, maybe he will now, but I found him on Poetizer, which is a poetry sharing app. I really think it's a nice app. No, I'm not being paid to promote it, but if you want to check out another side to the poetry community or you want to exercise your skills, Poetizer is a great platform for that. I'm reading you Old Fashioned Lover by King Sella. Little by little, my young eyes wanted to see. Little by little, my desperate hand wanted to feel. Your skin, your hair under the shade of trees. Old fashioned lover, you are a beautiful dress in person and a magician in question. Smile, oh smile, I see an open source of fountain, side by side. We reflect and shine. We are cursed with happiness. Old fashioned lover, you are mysterious and fine and sweet as wine. Next we have Muse, and it reads, Everyone speaks, but I spoke with my heart, and they were amused. My lips carried emotions, so I penned mine, and they said it was poetry. Again, that is some good writing. So go and show him some support. This next poet is quite popular, but I think he's the balance between Insta poetry and poetry. His handle is at poetry on Instagram. How lucky. And he is Ben Pedery. Here is a lovely poem of his titled Release, and it reads I made a god out of the glimmer in your eyes that I could only catch at an angle. Never mind, never lost upon me, drawn to impossibility. 
but in need of a release. To a place where you can't smile through me. Where my name isn't dust on your shoulders. And this is the point where I tell you that that's all I got. I wish I had more suggestions for you for this episode. But I plan on exposing you and myself to more poets as episodes progress. Which brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you giving your time. If this is your first listen, I hope it was impressionable enough for you to join me again for another episode. If you're returning, your loyalty is unmatched and received with much gratitude. I'm sure you can tell that this was longer than usual. I'd like to start making more long-form content to explore concepts deeper. So I hope you enjoyed it. As always, my email is open for any further discussion on a topic, episode suggestions, and even poetry submissions. Please give the podcast's social media a follow, and whatever platform you are listening from, please follow or subscribe. If you know someone who enjoys Insta Poetry, or you think someone would enjoy this episode, go ahead and share it with them. Till next time.